Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Honestly, you don't want to be taking generic legal advice from a YouTube channel or podcast in any event. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing partner of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today I hope we're going to do a shorter episode of Virtual Legality. For those of you who have followed this show, you probably know how successful I have been when I say we're going to have a shorter show, so we'll see how that goes today. But I want to talk a little bit about the announcement that Apple made today uh, at one of their many, many press conferences where they announce new products and new services, uh, and they announced quite a few today as Apple moves into the kind of content subscription delivery business model, and at least partially away from the hardware-focused business model, and that's an entirely different podcast for an entirely different audience, Uh, but I could certainly talk about that at some length as well. Uh, But what I wanted to focus on today was their unveiling of their Apple Arcade service. And if you don't regularly play mobile games, uh, you probably don't know that the App Store is absolutely rife uh, with various different business models and different games that are coming out every day. And the one thing that everybody can agree on is that there is an overall discoverability problem with the App Store. Uh, In the interest of full disclosure, in about, I think, 2012 or so, seven years ago, my brother and I actually made a couple of iOS apps, uh, and you can look them up uh, today. Uh, The company doesn't make them available through the App Store anymore because Apple charges to keep those uh, titles up and available, Uh, but there are articles that were done about them that we're pretty proud of, and the games were called Flipship uh, and Little Labyrinths. Uh, and Flipship was uh, released uh, to some critical acclaim. I think it's got a Metacritic score of 85 or something like that. Uh, it's got some very high scores from uh, Game Zebo and my, one of my personal favorite critics, Tom Chick, over at Quarter to Three. Look up Flipship, all one word. I think it was a Kotaku app of the day one day. Uh, and that was very exciting to us. Uh, and we released that really on the cusp of the kind of free-to-play revolution on the App Store. And unfortunately for us, Uh, we sold a very small number of copies of those games. And I'm still very, very proud of them. I helped do the writing and the quality assurance testing uh, and some other things on those games. Uh, But it really didn't make sense for us to proceed with the kind of app store development cycle and the iOS. And we knew we were a game of the week. We were were shown by Apple and we just didn't make any money. Uh, And so I am very sympathetic to developers and to folks that say, hey, we want to do this for a living. We want to put that app out there. We get these good reviews. We get this critical acclaim. We get people on forums and emailing us saying how much they love our product. And it just doesn't sell. It just doesn't make enough money to feed a family. And thus, now my brother is out in California making AAA games. More power to him. He's a great, great developer and a kind of brilliant game design mind. Uh, But Apple wanted to address this problem among many other problems they wanted to address with their uh, iOS ecosystem. And so they unveiled the Apple Arcade. I'm going to bring up an article right now uh, from Game Daily Biz and Amanda Farrow, uh, who you may have heard of uh, in this video series, Virtual Legality, because I have uh, given quotes to Game Daily Biz and been involved with a couple of their writers to put out articles. And I really think they're a good resource for those of you that are more interested in the kind of business side of the game industry. They do a a really nice job of it. They're a younger uh, website, uh, but I like to check them out uh, on a regular basis. And they put out this article and it says, Apple unveils arcade service to launch this fall with 100 exclusive games. While this might be helpful for discoverability, it doesn't bode well for developers if payment is based on game minutes played rather than the value of the game itself. And that's really where the discussion has been today. Uh, And I am not nearly as circumspect as a couple of the things we're going to see, uh, especially some comments from Matt Piscatella, who is a very good Twitter follow and uh, is very often responsive to questions that you have on the sales 
uh, and the licensing and the royalties and other business questions about the video game industry, I highly recommend the follow. And he's very uh, circumspect about this business model and what it means for the iOS ecosystem, a little bit more so than me, which might surprise regular listeners or watchers of virtual legality. Uh, insofar as I'm generally pretty circumspect about business models and decisions made by these corporations and how they're going to make money and return on investment. Uh, but I'm a little bit more uh, open-minded about this particular approach. We're going to talk about why. Uh, continuing with the article, Apple has announced a brand new subscription gaming service called Apple Arcade at its showcase event in California. During the showcase, product marketing manager Ann Tai took the stage to announce the new service with 100 exclusive games that will be available for Apple devices only. Arcade games will be available to download as the service is not based in the cloud and the games aren't streamed. So this isn't a Google Stadia type initiative. That was important that they wanted to communicate. This isn't something where they're running it on cloud servers back home and you're only streaming it to your devices. This is a totally normal video game download service. It's just paid for on a subscription basis. So if you're thinking about this at home, this is really the equivalent of the Xbox Game Pass that says... For $10 a month, we're going to give you access to this 100 games. We're going to rotate that around like Netflix. uh, And uh, tomorrow you'll have access to a different 80 games uh, because 20 come off and 20 come on. But you download the games, you have that access. And if you ever stop your subscription, you'll lose that access. And that's really what the subscription is. So it's a lot similar to that than it is to kind of the Google Stadia approach. And again, if you followed that video, check it out on Virtual Legality. Uh, We don't actually know their business model. It's anticipated that they probably are going to have a subscription component at the Google level, uh, but we don't actually know whether they're licensing games or selling subscriptions or what they're doing uh, because their event at GDC was not terribly informative on the details of what their product offering actually is. But that's another video. Please do check that out if you're interested. Um, They said, confirming rumors, the service fee will be divided among the game developers based on how much time gamers spend playing each game. Games Beat reported. NPD Group video game uh, analyst Matt Piscatella weighed in with his thoughts on Twitter. And we're going to go to that Twitter stream uh, in just a second uh, because I commented on it and Matt commented back to me. And that's part of the discussion to be had. Uh, But he says, my take, subscription services are generally good for market growth. He's, He's spoken in the past about his analysis of how Xbox Game Pass is working and how it's not hurting the sales of video games as some had feared, but is in fact enhancing a lot of the sales of products on the Xbox uh, and on the Xbox Live ecosystem. Continuing with his tweet, however, paying developers based on a time played metric will be bad for game variety, lock future game development into a select set of paths, and ultimately not be good for that platform's gaming as a whole. Taking a step back, and we're going to read this article from Game Daily Biz a little bit more, and then we're going to put the description, uh, put the link in our description so that you can check it out yourself. Absolutely give Game Daily Biz the clicks. They're a good site. Uh, they deserve them. Uh, Matt is trying to say, uh, and he said this in a number of his other tweets, so I don't feel uh, like I'm trying to read his mind on this, uh, that paying developers for the, the, the amount of time that you play the game is going to encourage this kind of Pavlovian psychological game development that is one of the things that is really causing the game industry some heartburn right now, that is causing regulatory bodies across the world to really look at the game industry and say, hmm, is that something we need to be concerned about? Because certain game companies are really starting to emulate uh, gambling companies and figuring out exactly how to tickle the brain in the exact right way to keep you interacting with the game. Uh, In a non-subscription-based world, that generally means selling you loot boxes, making sure there's enough whistles and dings and explosions and blasts and colorful things that happen to encourage you to make whatever the equivalent of one more pull on that slot machine in that video game actually is. Uh, That's one of the reasons opening a loot box is uh, such an explosive, colorful, sound-driven experience is because they want you to get that endorphin rush from opening those things. In a subscription-based world, Matt is suggesting, okay, if we're going to get paid, if there's 100 games on this service and I get paid more money if you spend 20% of your time with my game rather than 10% of uh, your time with my game, I am going to go down development paths that encourage what we might consider from the outside, from somebody that's not engaged with the game, uh, as essentially wasteful, wasting time. Uh, This was a, a common concern 
when MMOs first started propping up, that you had your World of Warcraft uh, and your EverQuest money going in, and didn't it make sense for these developers to essentially waste your month so that you had to go across to the next month in order to experience all the content available so that they could collect another $15 or whatever that amount was at the time. And so rather than quick travel, rather than mounts, rather than whatever it would be in the MMO environment, you have to walk back and forth. Uh, and you don't get any way to turn in a quest without walking back to the town that gave it to you. And maybe you can only hold three quests instead of 15 or whatever it is. This has been a common refrain of discussion in the MMO environment because there is that subscription feature. There are these folks that are paying $15 to have access to the game and aren't developers inclined to elongate things, to make it harder for people to experience all the content quickly. And I think in that framework, there's a legitimate concern there. I absolutely think there is. I understand what Matt's saying here, and I think there is a pressure that developers will have to encourage development, encourage the actual creative act of making their game and move it down a pathway in a fashion that will elongate people's experiences with their games, regardless of whether that's enjoyable for the game design itself. Uh, taken to its extreme, you could imagine a game that has a good gameplay element, but just has triply long loading screens, if that's what made sense, because that time is likely to count in whatever the way Apple is counting game game time played with their subscription service. So I think there is a legitimacy of the concern there, uh, but this is a more complex issue than what Matt is, is saying. And some of that comes out in the remainder of this Game Daily Biz article and the role that Apple intends to take here. Um, it says, to the contrary, to the contrary of what we just discussed, IHS Market's Piers Harding roles commented on why Arcade might be a good solution for game developers and Apple alike though it won't apply to the vast majority of developers. With Arcade, Apple has identified a gap in the market for a curated subscription product which supports unique and exclusive content, is not monetized through IAP, in-app purchases, or ads, and that is particularly suited to specific demographics, including younger players, family audiences, and other users that like to play premium games, he said over email. In addition, all content on Apple Arcade will be exclusive, which will make it more attractive to users considering which services to sign up for in the future. Uh, the two most troubling aspects of the games app market is getting content discovered and paying for user acquisition. As we talked about at the beginning of this video, discoverability is a continuing issue for Apple. And so one of the things that Apple Arcade is doing is it's having Apple curate this subscription. It is picking out what one would assume is something like the best of the best. That's certainly how they're likely to market it. It's really going to be the developers that sign on that are also premium and good and that Apple likes. Uh, but that if you purchase this subscription service, you're not going to be dealing with all these ads. You're not going to be dealing with energy bars. You're not going to be dealing with these various things that would otherwise limit your ability to engage with uh, a game. Uh, on mobile. One of the things that's really annoying to mobile players that are also what we would call core gamers or gaming hobbyists is that you want to experience a game. There's a lot of good designs out there. There's a lot of good experimental work being done in the mobile space. But because that market has basically expressed that they're not willing to really pay for the base game and they're only really, really willing to pay in this kind of micro transactions installments, the fact that Candy Crush makes a billion dollars doesn't impact the fact that you can't play a good design, uh, you can't play something that you would like to play in something like uh, Fire Emblem World or something along those lines without dealing with the same kind of gotcha mechanics and the same kind of loot box mechanics because they understand they can't just sell, in the, for the most part, a $20 game and say, hey, this is yours and you can go and enjoy it and we made our money and everybody's happy. So Apple's trying to solve this problem by saying, we are going to work as a company to curate to identify these games that people will really like, that they will really enjoy, that are worth whatever amount of money we charge for it because they didn't reveal what that is. I would anticipate something less than $10, I would guess, uh, or maybe the $10 mark uh, per month, uh, but we shall see. Uh, and that if you've already paid for those things, essentially, psychologically, it's free to you to download. Anybody that has Xbox Game Pass knows this. Once you've already paid that kind of entry fee, it's, it's free. You, you, everything is available to you. You should go and explore those games. You should go and enjoy those games. And I think that that curation process could very well work for Apple um, because of the incentives that are 
aligned between these developers and between Apple to make sure that the product that they're trying to sell through this subscription actually makes sense. Uh, but let's take a look at what Matt actually said, what I said, and, and have a look at that discussion because I do think it's interesting. We already talked about his baseline tweet where he says it's going to lock f- folks into future game development paths. It's not going to be good for that platform's gaming on a whole. To which I said, I don't disagree, but is there a better methodology for payment of developers? It seems a difficult nut to crack. And the reason I asked that question is because on its face, and we can talk about the kind of second order functions of what it does to gaming, what it does to the Apple ecosystem, what it does um, to what you're actually experiencing in the development process. But on its face, you have to sit back and say, okay, Apple wants to pay the subscription amounts, it's going to take maybe 30% of the total subscription amounts, and it's going to split up the 70%. And how does it split it up between the developers? And on its face, if you've got 100 games and you can see how long people are playing the various games, isn't it an equitable solution to say, hey, we are going to split it up pro rata uh, based on how much people are playing the various games. If nobody's playing Game X, it doesn't make a lot of money from the subscription pool. And if people are spending 95% of their time on Game Y, why shouldn't Game Y get 95% of the money from the subscriptions? It clearly earned it based on what we're actually collecting and what people are playing. So I think on its face, what Apple is doing without kind of looking at these second order functions does make sense as an equitable solution, which doesn't mean that we should dismiss what Matt has to say because I think he makes some good points, as we've already said. But I do think that Apple has a winning PR hand to essentially say, hey, look, we can see this data. We can see... Because people aren't buying these things, this is the best way to show exactly how much value, how much utility people are getting out of these various game services. That being said, certainly if you're looking at games as they exist today, somebody could be a Metal Gear Solid fan and they could be a Call of Duty fan uh, and they could love Metal Gear Solid way, way more than Call of Duty, but they still like both. And because of what Call of Duty is, a multiplayer game in which you're going in every night and you're filling bars and you're collecting weapons or whatever it is that you're doing, you could play that game for 200 hours easily if that's your bag, if that's what you're into. And Metal Gear Solid, as great as it is, one of the best games of all time, you can basically beat in six hours. And maybe you play that once or twice a year, but it's never going to hit the number of something like an Apex Legends or something like a Call of Duty. And so I think Matt's absolutely correct to say, when you've got that differentiation, you're talking about limiting the ability of developers to really make the most money, to really make what they have earned uh, if they're making short single-player games. If you're making something that is only a single-player experience that you do, that you really thoroughly enjoy, that says something about the human condition, that tells a narrative that has these characters that you love, even if it's 40 hours long, if there's something out there like Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes and it's sitting out there and you can just play it and play it and play it and you can play it for a thousand hours, then that 40-hour game that you loved so much is going to get a dime compared to the dollar that the Galaxy of Heroes type game gets. And I think that is worthy of concern. Uh, But it's not the whole story when we talk about what Apple has said they're going to do, which, again, we've talked about corporations a lot. What they say they are going to do, even if they want to, doesn't always match with what they actually do or what they can do after looking at what the actual political landscape is, what the actual development landscape is when they go in to try to curate these games, when they go in to try to figure out what the product or the service actually is. Uh, Matt goes on in response to me saying developers should be able to negotiate the terms of the agreements for the content they own. If this is a take it or leave it proposition, it's a bad one. Again, I don't like this model. This is Matt. I don't like this model. If it's really just Apple handing them the contract and saying agree to the pro rata or don't, then he thinks it's a bad deal. And I don't disagree. I say, okay, but I'm not sure ad hoc negotiations against Apple is a viable strategy, especially for up and comers, which is to say, when you're negotiating these contracts, you can maybe move things a little bit. And you can maybe move things a little bit more if you're a big deal. If you're Epic Games and you're releasing Infinity Blade Part 5, you can talk to Apple. You can say, Apple, we're not willing to do X, Y, or Z. Yes, we'll prorate the sales if we want to be a part of the subscription service, uh, but you're going to give us a flat fee up front to make sure it's worth our time. You can have those negotiations if you're a bigwig, if you have that leverage, if you have those lawyers. But when you're talking about the flip ships of the world, notwithstanding the fact that I'm a lawyer who made that game, uh, when you're talking about those smaller companies that are up and comers and Apple comes to them and says, please be a part of our subscription service. We've plucked you out of the ether. We think you're a good product. We're going to put you on this service 
uh, but you have to sign this contract. I don't think that Matt saying developers should be able to negotiate their own licenses helps out that scenario. Uh, so I think that while that makes a lot of sense, hey, great, if you can afford a lawyer, if you have some leverage, if you can say no to Apple, if you can negotiate your terms, that's great. It's not viable in all circumstances, and especially when you're starting out and essentially proving what you can do in the video game space. So I think what's more worthwhile is discussing whether or not this is a good deal or not a good deal on its face. And as we've said, I think he makes some good points, but I don't think this is the kind of thing that you can negotiate with Apple very easily. And this is coming from someone uh, in myself who regularly negotiates with these big companies, knows exactly how negotiable a non-negotiable document is, how much you can get away with uh, on a fairly regular basis. And a lot of it just depends on what kind of company you are and what kind of leverage you have. I go on in my tweet to say, I share your concern about the incentives, but on its face, time played seems a relatively equitable way to share subscription fees, which we've talked about. And then he says, then it'll be very, very bad for gaming on the platform. And I'd recommend devs think very carefully about participating in a program like this. And I respond finally with that's fair. I think that advice will be given that devs need to be very cautious about this. And I suspect the service itself will devolve into a bunch of time consuming junk for that reason. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Because when I made this tweet, I didn't fully understand exactly how strong a hand Apple is claiming to be able to put on this product. But I've got issues with Apple across the board today. Again, as we said at the beginning of the video, I have so many concerns about their business model, especially News Plus and what they're trying to do with their services. Uh, maybe that'll be another virtual legality we can talk about some other time. Let me know if that sounds like something that you'd be interested in. And But I say I, pr I appreciate you sharing your thoughts uh, to Matt because he does take the time to put these thoughts out there on Twitter. He's a good follow. Check him out. Um, but one of the things I say here, which is it will devolve into a bunch of time-consuming junk, I think that's the natural order of things. If everybody could just sign up for the subscription service. It's just, hey, anybody that wants to come on can get it. They get their percentage of the minutes that anybody plays of it. I think that's exactly what will happen. Exactly. That you'll have all of these. I, I, I keep bringing up Galaxy of Heroes just because I've played it a lot and it is time consuming. I've enjoyed my time with it. That's a free to play game. So I don't know how great a match it is for what Apple is talking about with the subscription service. But it is the type of game that can really just eat away hours while you're watching a sporting event or hanging out, uh, talking with someone or otherwise just kind of uh, fiddling around, wasting time while you're waiting for something. That all of those types of games would dominate the service. They'd collect all the money and every other kind of experimental, experiential, narrative, plot driven, character driven a single player game will be driven out of the market because they can't make money on this because even if it's the greatest five hour game of all time, you can't match the numbers of something that is using these models. And Matt's absolutely right to call that out. But I think it underplays what Apple is claiming they're going to do here and whether or not they'll have success with that is a different question. But if Apple can successfully curate the experience one of the things that's very important when talking about contractual relationships are the incentives of the people involved. How does Apple make its money selling this subscription experience? It has people willing to pay, let's say $10 a month, just because that's an easy round number. We don't know what they're going to charge because they haven't said, but if they can attract people that are willing to pay $10 a month, if that value proposition is lost, Apple loses money. They have every incentive to make sure that people think they are getting good value out of that $10. And I will tell you right now, if the subscription service became what Matt fears, what I say is a service that devolves into a bunch of time-consuming junk, then one would expect if that's not what the market wants, if that's not what the people want, if that's not what Apple's customer base wants, then Apple's going to find itself in a bad way. Apple needs to curate the subscription service in such a fashion that the various developers are providing games that you can't get anywhere else and that provide good value for those folks $10. And I do think that Apple has every incentive to look at what is actually being put into the subscription service and say, we don't want that time consuming stuff. We don't want that junk. We don't want stuff that is just gaming the system to try to get more minutes. And if I were Apple, to be perfectly honest, I would think strongly about having essentially, uh, at bare minimum, a developer's advisory committee. Uh, maybe all of the developers, if it's only 100, that's probably something that you could manage. But if it's more than that, essentially a group of developers that can say, hey, we're evaluating this game. 
that game is using tricks. It's doing tricky business to get more minutes. It's taking away from all of our pots of money. Uh, and we don't want them to be a part of the subscription service. We don't think they are playing fair. And to have the developers essentially police the subscription service or at least participate in the policing of the description uh, of the subscription service themselves. That's where you essentially can magnify the alignment of interest. The developers want to make money. Apple wants to make money. Apple doesn't care that much about who makes money out of the pool as much as it matters that the aggregate pie is large enough. So there is a small disconnect there, which is what Matt is identifying in so far as if Apple doesn't care, then the developers are the ones that really have to be concerned about getting uh, lost in the shuffle from these other behemoths that are trying to take 70, 80, 90% of the time. Uh, but if you can have a policing system, if you do have a strong hand at curation, I think you could have a product that works well. Um, I don't know whether Apple will do that. The second part of this is that I don't really love Apple's current business models. I don't really love their direction. I don't really love their strategic leadership. Uh, and I think that the showcase today really shows some missteps, some business decisions that I wouldn't have made. So when I talk about this in the video, it's essentially hypothetical where I say, I think Apple could do this. They could manage it in such a way that it makes sense. I don't think that time played as a metric if you're talking about a curated environment is one that automatically leads to destitution and despair. But it depends very much on the leadership. It depends very much on the folks that are selling the subscription. And that means it very much depends on how Apple actually runs things. And there, I couldn't agree more that Matt has every reason to believe that there should be some concern there because Apple has not in the recent past shown itself to be a good steward of the app store or to be making awesome decisions with respect to its own business models. Uh, and that's well outside of video games. Like I said, there's News Plus. There's a bunch of stuff that they announced today where I think a reasonable mind could say, hmm, I'm not sure about that Apple stock. Let's see how they do. Uh, which is all a long way of saying, I think that reasonable minds can differ as to the uh, success or the intended success of the Apple Arcade what it means for game development. I do think there are ways that you could police it where game developers can feel more comfortable and not get sucked into this kind of ever increasing downward spiral of essentially gotcha games and things that just take up time. I think this is a question uh, of business models that has been discussed before, as I said in this video, uh, with respect to MMOs. Uh, and I think it's one where you see in those MMOs that yes, there is a tension there. There is a tension where developers want to kind of elongate things, but there's also a breaking point where they do, you don't just see a World of Warcraft where you have to cross continents eight times to complete one mission because there's a point where you can't push people past. Uh, and developers have to figure that out where people are still having fun, where they still feel that they are getting more than their $15 of value out of whatever the game proposition is. And to that extent, I'm pretty agnostic. Uh, I think Matt looks at it and says, I don't want to have all these gotcha games. I don't want to have all these different types of games that maybe I don't enjoy that much. For me, I don't enjoy them that much either. Uh, but if it turns out that Apple can sell a $10 product and these people can feel like they're getting more than $10 of value out of that product, even if the games aren't ones that I necessarily wind up liking, I say, okay, more power to you. As long as you're getting more than your $10 of value out of whatever Apple's providing, who am I to say that you shouldn't be? Uh, and that's coming from someone who's seen the game industry really evolve in ways that maybe I'm not fully in 100% enjoying uh, in terms of sh all shooters all the time, FPSs and third-person action adventures. And I preferred it when it was a game industry that seemed to have a little bit more breadth and depth, uh, especially in kind of like the PlayStation 2 era or before. Uh, and so I think it's worth saying uh, it's not up to me. Uh, if there is a market there, I don't know that it is the worst thing if different people are enjoying them in a different fashion than I would like. And I'm very, very interested all the time, uh, if you followed virtual legality, you know this, in seeing how business models work in the real world. This is fun. This is experiential. This is experimental. Uh, and we get to follow it in real time and see how it does. We've got Google Stadia coming out. We've got Game Pass still doing what it's doing on Xbox. We have whatever PlayStation is going to do with PlayStation 5. And now we have Apple entering into its own subscription fray uh, and probably some other players that are going to come out of the woodwork as well. I tweeted the other day about how Walmart is exploring streaming video games. There are going to be major, major changes in the industry. And yes, that's terrifying. And yes, folks that have grown up with an industry a certain way don't necessarily like that. But if you can get on the other side and say, hey, the world is always changing. This stuff is fun and it's exciting to see what changes. And maybe I don't even know what I'm going to love tomorrow. That's the way I prefer to look at things. So 
I absolutely appreciate Matt's analysis. I think he's got a lot of right thoughts. I think it very well could go the way he says. I'm very hopeful that it doesn't. And I want to watch it. I want to see what happens. And I'm not as willing to say, oh, it's done. It's going to hurt the game industry. It's going to be this terrible thing. I'm just not there yet. And I hope you all enjoy watching what happens as well, because it's going to be interesting whichever way it goes. And that's really today's virtual legality. If you like this episode, please like it. Please subscribe. Please comment on this episode. Tell me how wrong I am to believe that Apple could actually make this work or how right I am to think there is a way in which subscription services that are based on time played could actually function in an environment like ours today. Uh, Otherwise, please do share it around. There's a lot of places on the internet that I can't get to, whether that's Reddit or Tumblr or NeoGAF or Reset Era that I'm just not available to get to because I'm doing my day job and practicing law. Uh, So please do share it around if you think it's interesting, if you think it's exciting, if you want to get other people engaging with this video. I really do get a lot of engagement from first-time viewers who are engaging with this kind of stuff, business and law of video games. Uh, On a first-time basis, I love to have those conversations, so please do share it around. Otherwise, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you so very much for watching. And if you're listening to it on its podcast format, thank you so very much for listening. And I will catch you on the next Virtual Legality.